<laughs> this is great. Yeah. All right. I and then, you. oh, what did you say? I told Dr. Kirkham I miss him. Oh. <laughs> I've well, seen him 30 that's years. Life. <laughs> 30 well, years. Yeah, I've heard Thank lots you. of patients say that they miss you, Dr. Kirkham. Me and yes. Mick was his favorite uh, patients. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure everybody was his favorite patient. I thought I was his favorite patient. <laughs> yeah, yeah. y'all are all his favorite <laughs> patients. <laughs> I have I you beat. I've been over 40 years with Dr. Yeah. So. Wow. Yeah. So. Subi's husband was with Air France. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Her daughter was with the FBI or the CIA. Or now the State Department. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she graduated from, I think, uh, Richmond University or University of Richmond, however you could call it. Wow, smart family members. <laughs> Thank you for remembering, Dr. Kirkham. I, had, I haven't lost that part. You know? <laughs> and the land weirds, I, their family, I, I mean, oh, yeah, Jack Gilders. <laughs> No. Uh, it, it, during hunting season, they would bring me venison. Oh, neat. Yeah. yummy. It was great. Awesome. All right. We, we uh, have some for you now. <laughs> <laughs> we do. I'll call oh. you. <laughs> awesome. All right. Welcome, June. June is getting on the um, Zoom right now. So let's give a cup, um, about 20 more seconds, and everybody can hear us well, correct? Yes. Good. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and get started here. Everything looks good. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, do an introduction about what we're going to speak about. And then I'll do an introduction about total hearing care. And then I'll do an intro for our guest speaker, Dr. Kirkham. Okay. So I'm going to share my screen here. And we still have more people, more and more people coming in. So that's great. So one moment while I share my screen. All right. And there we go. All right. So everybody can see Dr. Kirkham here. So our topic today is otolaryngology with Dr. Wayne Kirkham. Okay. And on the agenda, I'm going to give an introduction of total hearing care and Dr. Kirkham here. We're going to kind of go over some common questions for ENTs like um, Dr. Kirkham. And then we're going to have an open forum for all of y'all to ask any questions that you want to ask. And then we'll have a quick little conclusion. And at the very end, we will have a drawing um, for someone to win a gift card. And so if you have not already typed your name in the chat box or shouted it out to Brittany, go ahead and do that now and we'll get you into that drawing there. Okay, so this is total hearing care. We have five locations across the Metroplex to help you. We have the OG, the original location um, that is off of Abrams and Mockingbird. We have our second location was our Coit and Campbell location. We have like an East Lake Garland Road location. We have the location that we're at today that Dr. Kirkham, Kirk, Dr. Kirkham and I are at today. It is our Glen Lakes Drive, which is pretty much Walnut Hill Lane and 75. Not hard to find, right? Not hard to find. Good, good. Looks like a house. And then we have our new Plano location, which is off of Preston Road. So we can help you at any of our locations and all of our databases are shared between locations so we can um, have access to your health information, all of them. If you have any questions during the middle of this,
presentation, feel free to let us know. You can tap it, type it in the chat box, or you can always, you know, shout out and ask us during a pause. All right. There. Okay, so this is Dr. Kirkham's introduction here. And Dr. Kirkham, you want to talk a little bit about yourself and, and what, what you've done, your accomplishments? Oh, one moment. Well, I'm an orolaryngologist, uh, ear, nose, throat surgeon. Uh, I was in practice up until basically a little over a year ago and had to have significant orthopedic surgery because I tore a tendon in my foot. And they said I'd be wiped out two to three months, double that, but at least I can walk now and I don't have any pain. But my background is, uh, I, I'm from uh, the state of Wisconsin. I grew up in Northern Wisconsin and I trained in Madison at the University of Wisconsin undergrad medical school residency. I did my internship down here in Dallas, and uh, my wife was a PhD. Uh, the, the two of us said we got to go back to Dallas. So that's how we've been. And uh, I was in practice for roughly uh, 46 years. So. And that's, uh, you know, in all aspects of orthodontology, from anything to do with the ears, nose, mouth, and throat. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for being our sure, guest speaker to today. Be. So we have some common questions here we're gonna go through and then um, we will have an open forum. So a lot of patients, you know, they say, how do I know when to see an ENT or otolaryngologist? I, how can I put it? I, if you're having problems hearing, ringing in the ears, vertigo, and, and don't just say you're dizzy. Because there's a lot of things that can make you dizzy. Uh, inner ear vertigo, the room will be spinning either to the left or to the right. Mm -hmm. If you get up fast and you feel a little off, that's not your ear. If you bend over and arise uh, quickly, that's not your ear. So you can call that dizziness, but that's not ear origin dizziness. If you wake up in the middle of the night and the room is spinning to your left or spinning to your right, you've got problems going on in your inner ear. And, and you really need to see an ear and nose throat doctor because your primary care doctor really, that isn't his or her ball game. Nasal, obviously, if your nose is obstructed, bleeding, uh, you know, pain in your face, everybody calls, nasal congestion sinus that's like saying you have knee or elbow uh, you may have pain in your knee or you may have a clicking in your knee but you don't have knee unless you're missing a, a leg you, you 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 have a knee but you have something going on so the nose is the same difference and and sinus disease is not just nasal obstruction we breathe through our nose we don't breathe through our sinuses but there's a lot of potential for problems with the nose and sinuses. Everything that makes you sneeze is not an allergy. Every nasal stuffiness, every cough is not necessarily an allergy. Mouth and throat, well, uh, in kids, it's obviously tonsillitis is a common problem, but it also happens in adults. Uh, again, bleeding from the mouth, uh, cancer is, is common uh, in the mouth and throat for various reasons uh, related mainly to smoking and virus called HPV. Um, but, you know, if you got problems going on in there, somebody needs to be able to look. And unfortunately, some of the areas that people will, will think about is, is they'll go to their primary care doctor, they take a tongue blade and they just hold a, a little bitty light usually that they use to look in somebody's ear with, yeah. I'd call it otoscope, and, and they just shine it in and they say, well, I don't see anything. Yeah, but you gotta be able to look down at the vocal cords, up at the back of the nose, and, and look in these areas. And it, it, it may not be able to say what it is, but if it doesn't look right, then it needs to really be further evaluated. And, I mean, the vocal cords, basically, we otolaryngologists stop 
once you get below the vocal cords. But the vocal cords are, are a big part of my background because I was in music before I went into medicine. And that's basically the area you, you go to. The head and neck surgery part of laryngology is having to do with lumps and bumps and masses, be it in the face, in the neck, uh, a lump in the neck or a lump around the parotid gland. Usually these are related to tumors, not always. Uh, infections can cause a lot of lumps in certain areas and it needs to be evaluated. Um, sometimes the first sign of a cancer in the head and neck region is a lump in the neck. They, they, they have no other symptoms but that. And you just, the reason to go to an laryngologist is, is he or she can look at those areas that the, the primary care doctors just can't. They don't have the equipment and they, you know, you, you can't be all things to everybody. Uh, Correct. If you're having gynecologic problems, go to the gynecologist. You know, if you got a broken leg, go see an orthopedic surgeon. I mean, it's, uh, it, it just, Medicine is not like the days of the frontier. Uh, you, you, you really need to concentrate on one area. The specific, yeah. I agree with you 100%. I have patients all the time, Dr. Kirkham, that they come in and they're like, I can't hear, but my primary care physician looked in my ears and I'm like, well, they're, they're full of wax. So, you know, and, and they're like, well, you know, primary care physician, they're, you know, they're trying to get the whole picture and, and, and it's, it's difficult, but thank you for explaining about, hey, when do I need to see? Yeah, it, it, I mean, we're, it, it's a great field. But I love it. Yeah. So what kind of hearing loss can be treated by an ENT? Well, uh, basically, you've got conductive hearing loss where sound can't get in through the nerve of hearing. And usually that's uh, amenable either to medication or surgery. Uh, and if you got fluid in your middle ear and you can sometimes get rid of it with medication, children develop fluid frequently, it's called serous otitis media or otitis media with a fusion, uh, however you want to call it, it's fluid behind the eardrum. And if you can't get rid of it with medicine, you can get rid of it with surgery, make an incision in the eardrum called a myringotomy or a tympanostomy. And you put a tube in, it's a common procedure because ear disease is common, especially in kids, but adults get tubes as well. Um, if the ear bones don't move, the usual bone that doesn't move or has a problem is the stapes bone, the stirrup. But the other bones can have problems as, as well. And uh, by audiometric testing, you can pretty much predict what you're going to run into. And that can usually 99% of the time you can fix that with surgery. Uh, but nerve hearing loss is a different ball game. Uh, if it's acute, a sudden nerve hearing loss, uh, which can be profound, you want to hit them with medication and there's a good chance you can resolve that. Uh, but if it doesn't resolve and the person is stuck with a a hearing loss that's of a sudden onset, usually caused by a virus, um, then hearing aids play a role. If it's hearing loss that's there because of noise exposure, uh, which is common, or you have a, you can't pick your parents, uh, you, and you can inherit a hearing loss. Uh, you can be born with a hearing loss, and there are children that are born totally deaf. Uh, but that isn't as often as, as acquired hearing loss from noise exposure or shooting guns or just noisy environment. But if your genetic predisposition is to uh, eventually start to lose your hearing, I don't have a lot of hair, but this is genetic. But I've got some. Uh, and again, you can't pick your parents. So you got to deal with the cards you're dealt with on that. But the, the role of hearing aids is to try to make up for problems that you either inherited or acquired. Let's put it that way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How many uh, stapedectomies do you feel like you've performed? 
uh, thousands. I, I, I trained, again, I, I'm from Wisconsin. I trained in Wisconsin. The general population of Wisconsin is a bunch, I, I spoke in German all my life. Half the town that I grew up in in Northern Wisconsin spoke German. Uh, it's basically, when I was growing up in Wisconsin, if you weren't German, you were Norwegian. My mother's parents were off the boat from Norway. Uh, Kirkham's a British name, but remember Anglo-Saxon, Saxony is in Germany. Uh, it, it, it's for Germans. But the people, of, especially of Northern European extraction, all racial and ethnic groups get a condition called otosclerosis, also called otospongiosis, but otosclerosis is what you're in. And it tends to run in families, it's inherited, it can happen out of the blue, but it tends to run in families and, it, and it's much more common in people of Northern European extraction. Mm -hmm. Basically, uh, here we are at the University of Wisconsin in Madison where I did my residency and we were doing stapedectomies all the time. And it's a great procedure. You go in and you take out the stapes bone because it's not moving and you put an artificial bone in there that will move and you basically restore their hearing and you can restore them back to absolutely excellent hearing. Uh, and since I, where I trained, it was a common problem. Uh, I had extensive experience and I saw everything that, that was weird and different. So by the time I went into practice, my attitude was throw the ball up and I'll hit it out of the park. Uh, yeah, I, and as luck would have it, I ended up uh, seeing a lot of people with otosclerosis. And it, it doesn't happen in both ears always, but it's common to get it in both ears. And I will tell you, uh, it, it's a guarantee if you fix the one ear, they're going to come back for the second ear. There's, and you can really, you have a happy, happy patient because they, you restore their hearing. It's a fabulous procedure. Uh, it, it, and it's fun as a, as a surgeon. I maybe shouldn't say fun, but, but it, it, I, I love my patients. Uh, I mean, I, I'm happy to see some familiar faces. Um, it, you, you get a special bond when you've restored their hearing. I mean, restored it. Uh, and they don't forget it. Uh, yeah. You know, they'll bring cookies next time. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, well, yeah. Uh, it, and it's a great procedure, but it, again, it's a conductive hearing loss. You can get uh, otosclerosis that involves the cochlea. It's a, a change of the bone, and cochlear otosclerosis causes a nerve type hearing loss. That part you can't resolve with the surgery, but if they have Finestral, meaning where the oval window is, where the stapes fit, that's that totally correctable with surgery. The oval window is right there. Yeah. Yeah. The router, right. yep. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And here's some little tiny ear bones. We've got Dr. Kirkham's favorite there, the stapes yeah. right there. And these are very, I don't know if you can see them here, but they are very tiny. It's roughly three millimeters in length and two millimeters wide and you the procedure is all done under the microscope if you have a shake you, you won't be doing this procedure i don't have any shake so i haven't developed it yet it was uh i love the surgery it's, it's all very very tiny microscopic and you're under high power magnification and uh i had excellent training and i uh, it's a fabulous procedure. So you did at threading a needle because that's so tiny. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's, you got to take out the stapes uh -huh. and you can damage the ear in doing so. You got to know how, how to do it. And then you, you, you take cartilage that covers the bump. This is called the tragus, this bump. And you take cartilage from this, uh, the covering of the cartilage, tracheal perichondria, and you cover over the open oval window and the artificial stapes goes on top and is connected to the other ear bones, put the eardrum back down and head for the barn. And, it's, uh, and when you take the packing out, it, then you pack the ear canal. And see them back a week later to take the suture out of the ear and you take the packing out. 
I mean, they hear yeah. immediately, wow. and it's uh, life changing. Oh, it's it's a yeah. it, it's a it's an emotional moment. Yeah, that's life changing for those. Patients. Oh yeah, it's great. I mean, your your otosclerotic patients. Uh, they will send you other patients. Let's put it that way. Yeah, they're they're advertising. Yeah, they're. Their oh own. yeah. This was an interesting question. I've been asked twice by <laughs> patients, not just once. But um, will trimming my nose hairs make me more susceptible to germs? The answer is no. It won't make you more susceptible to germs. Let let but. Well, the nose, the, right inside the nose, is called the nasal vestibule. It has a resident population of bacteria, Staphylococcus. So Staph lives in it. Staph is on our skin. It's a skin bacteria. It's everywhere. But it's especially in a higher concentration in the nasal vestibule. I won't demonstrate, but if you stick your finger in your nose, you're in the nasal vestibule. That's where the nasal hairs called vibrissae are. Uh, you can trim them, and that's not a problem as long as you don't cut yourself. Mm -hmm. The problem with pulling nasal hairs is that's traumatic to the tissue. When you pull that hair out by the root, the bacteria have an immediate entrance into your system. Not a good idea, especially in an area that basically is a cesspool for bacteria. It's better to use... Uh, blunt tip scissors, or you can buy the, the nasal trimming devices, battery operated. Um, you know, I, I had a, a lady, I'll never forget it. Uh, she was 60, 70 years old, and she didn't like her nasal hairs. And her daughter brought her to me, and she had used Nair, which is a depilatory that you could put on your skin oh so that you want to get rid of hair. But she used it in her nose. Mm -hmm. and, and you got to remember that the nose, is, it starts out as skin inside the nose, and then it becomes mucous membrane. And when you put nair on the nose inside, and it gets on the mucous membrane, it's a fire. I mean, and she was miserable. And I'm going, you know, don't go putting nair in your nose to get rid of hair when it's... It's not that big a deal. I, you know, if it's, you can trim it. It's life. I mean, it's, yeah. it, it's just life. Uh, it's, but yeah, don't pull it, trim it. Yeah, I think, so there was a TikTok. Um, oh, TikTok. I know. <laughs> there was a TikTok challenge and what people were doing was putting, uh, getting a Q-tip, sticking it in hot wax and then sticking it up their nostrils to trim. And I think that's why I've been asked this question twice in the past two years or whatever because when they would pull it out I mean it was like waxing the inside of your nose and then they would get it stuck in there it would, don't, I wouldn't recommend yeah that. I would. <laughs> but I bet that's why I, I don't know <laughs> oh goodness yeah okay this is interesting I love this picture and so what type of throat voice disorders are there and what are we looking at I can't list all the voices. <laughs> um, what you're looking at on the left side of the screen, the, the horizontal spike curve is the epiglottis. And uh, that basically protects your airway when you swallow. If that doesn't move properly, or if that's a, a life-threatening condition, it's called epiglottitis, and that's an infection of the epiglottis, mainly seen in children, but it, you can die from it. It'll obstruct your airway. When you swallow, the epiglottis flips down and makes it so that food and water don't go the wrong direction, meaning down into your airway. The pearly white tissue down further with the black center area, those are your real vocal cords. The black is your airway. That's the entrance into your trachea. The V-shaped structures, those are what we call the airy epiglottic folds. And at the bottom of the V, that helps move uh, with your vocal cords. It's called the vocalis process. And that is just a part of the mechanism 
of airway protection. Remember, the vocal cord's first job is to protect the airway. A dog has vocal cords. A horse has vocal cords. Uh, they're, they're not talking to you, but the vocal cords protect the airway. The second job in people is for speech, but the first job is protect the airway. So if you have, uh, you're eating salad and salad, let's say it has vinegar and oil. Uh, olive oil, I dearly love it. I eat a lot of it. If it gets onto your vocal cords, it's gonna create a major coughing spell because it kind of lingers. It doesn't, it, it, oil will stay attached. Water-based stuff will be able to be coughed away quickly. But it, it, that your vocal cord is going to work to protect your airway. That's that has nothing to do with phonation. But the, the disorder is, I mean, vocal cord paralysis, lumps and bumps on the vocal cord, polyps, bleeding into the larynx. Uh, it, you know, cancer does it occur? Absolutely, it occurs in everything you see. There it doesn't have to be on the vocal cord, and it may not present with hoarseness right off the bat. It may just have be a change in how it feels when you swallow. But infection, obviously, everybody's had a throat infection somewhere along the line. And it doesn't always just stay at the level of the tonsils, which are in your upper throat, but it can be down below uh, a barking cough. It sounds like a dog barking. That's, that, the infection is uh, affecting the trachea below the vocal cords, right below it. So the, sub, the glottis is the opening where the vocal cords are. And the subglottis, right below the vocal cords. If that swells, you, when you cough, you'll, have a, you'll sound like a barking dog. Uh, croup is, is a swelling in that area. So you, you say that it's a croupy cough. It's really a barking dog sound to the cough. But uh, with my singers that I deal with, uh, you know, there's all sorts of things that can go wrong, but usually it's overuse and the side effects of that. And you got to be able to look at it, know what's normal and what's not normal. And uh, it takes a long time to get good at it. Let's put it that yeah. way. <laughs> but it's uh, it, it it's always a, a new. And when a patient walks in with something new and different, and, and scar tissue, or somebody else has operated on them, and they got too aggressive, or they, they uh, you know, some things you can fix and some things you can't. But uh, I had the, the good fortune of being in music before I went into medicine. And uh, the, if you know more about music, it's, it's easier to realize when they get into trouble with doing certain things. So uh, love the field. It's great. All right. And can my allergies affect my hearing? The answer is yes, um, but not significantly usually. Uh, first of all, make sure it's an allergy. Everybody who sneezes thinks it's an allergy. A, a sneeze is your body trying to get rid of an irritation in your nose. And uh, it can be just from dust. In the, you walk into a dusty house or whatever, uh, you don't have to be allergic to that dust, but it's irritating the line of your nose. In the winter time, especially in Dallas, uh, when the heat comes on, it'll dry out your house. Uh, and a dry nasal passageway, the humidity is down to 30%. Um, it, it, that'll cause you to sneeze and what have you. But if you truly are allergic, let's say to grass, mold, um, you know, pollens of some type, uh, you, the common mistake that, that people make because they see advertising on TV is they take an oral antihistamine. Oral antihistamines are not a dangerous drug, but oral antihistamine, one Zyrtec, Allegra, Claritin, Benadryl, one will cause the microscopic cilia, the little hairs that, that aren't the nasal hairs, but these are hairs that, that in essence move your mucus and they're in your sinuses, and they're in your nose, uh, and it's called ciliated epithelium. And they move the mucus that's made in your sinuses out into the nose and then down into your throat. One Zyrtec, they stop moving. 
Now, is that going to create a problem? Well, one isn't, but most of the time these people are popping in a Zyrtec every day, uh, twice a day, or Allegra. They're taking Benadryl because it helps make them sleep, but it, it's also shutting down their cilia. And that's an invitation for an infection. And the cilia also line your eustachian tubes. Well, your eustachian tubes, remember the ears are a part of the respiratory tract. You may not think of this being respiratory, but it connected to the back of the nose with the eustachian tube. You take an Allegra, the cilia stop moving. So the fluid that's made by little cells, the mucus, it's mucus that's made, uh, doesn't move. So it gets behind your eardrum and it, it can stay there. And then you've got a what we call a conductive hearing loss. Sound can't get through and you can try to pinch and pop you can do all that, and you may or may not get it to shape up. Uh, when you fly on an airplane, and if you don't equalize pressure, you may develop fluid in there, and then you'll have to have an intervention. The allergies can do it. If you're gonna, in this day and age, what's over the counter in the way of sprays, steroid sprays, Flonase being the most common, fluticasone, Excellent nasal steroid spray. It takes about 10 days to two weeks to kick into gear. A lot of times patients will come in, well, Dr. So-and-so told me to take Flonase. And I used it for two days and I didn't notice any change, so I quit. And I'm saying, did anybody tell you that it takes about two weeks to kick into gear? No, well, um, it doesn't work immediately. But it's a, it's a steroid spray, which cuts down on the irritability, the inflammation of the line of the nose. Uh, when used appropriately, safe, very safe. Uh, there's a, a histamine blocking agent, which is in a spray over the counter, it's called Astapro. Uh, it used to be by prescription called Astalin, azelastic, didn't taste very good. And they changed the formulation and made it into Astapro, added some sugar actually too. Um, and uh, that blocks the release of histamine from cells that are in your nose and, and they're called mast, M-A-S-T cells. Mast cells will release histamine in response to irritation and it blocks that. And for most people, the typical everyday ordinary allergies, which are relatively short-lived because they're seasonal, the combination of Flonase and Astel, Astapro you're under control. If that still doesn't do it, then get to an allergist and skin desensitization is, is excellent. There are some newer drugs on the market uh, that are advertised for asthma, for example. They're, they play the same role. Uh, we call them biologics. And that's a different ball game, but that's when people really can't respond to the more simpler Ways. But yeah, if you pop in a lot of antihistamines, you're inviting fluid in your middle ear, which will cause a temporary uh, hearing loss. Yeah. Wow. Thank you so much. So let's go ahead and do an open forum here for any questions for Dr. Kirkham. Yeah. We're going to come back here. And if you have any questions, feel free to shout it out or type it into the chat box here. Hi, Dr. Kirkham. It's Mary Jo Douglas. Hi, Mary Jo. You're looking good. <laughs> hey, I'm walking and I'm not in pain. <laughs> I, can do, I can do a slow dance with my wife, but the fast dance, we're not ready for that yet. <laughs> And that's how it happened. I tore my tendon ballroom dancing, which my wife and I have done since our first date. That's so. great. Well, my question is, um, there seems to be a lot of advanced technology, medical advanced technology and hip re knee replacement. It seems like they can replace just about anything when it's broken. Um, why isn't there a replacement where for a loss of hearing that you can just go in there and and replace all that and then we all can have perfect hearing. Well, uh, your, your question is well taken, but here's the thing, a hip replacement doesn't have anything to do with nerves. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, joint replacement 
doesn't have anything to do with nerves. Yeah. The limiting factor in hearing is the nerve of hearing, the eighth nerve. Yes. And we can replace the ear bones. I can, you can replace all three of the ear bones. You can replace the eardrum. So mechanically, you can do the things from the, but not including the nerve. Once the nerve has been damaged, it's, it's damaged. Now, is there research being done? The answer is yes, but it's probably not going to be, uh, I mean, stem cell research is, the, is where it's going to be. Uh, and they've been doing it mainly in mice, uh, but it's not ready for uh, human consumption. Uh, and it, it, the limiting factor is nerve. And, uh, you know, you just can't, you can't replace that. There's no such thing as a nerve transplant. For the, remember that the, the nerve is, a, it's a cranial nerve. So it, it leaves the brain and it goes to the cochlea, which is the hardest bone of the body. It, mm -hmm. And uh, you can operate on that nerve if it has a tumor, but you, you can't replace and the, and the changes, you can have a dead ear. You can cut the nerve of hearing in an ear that's got tinnitus ringing. And, and even though you've cut the nerve of hearing, now no hearing in the ear, their brain will still say they've got ringing in that dead ear. Uh, yeah. That's at the level of the cerebral cortex. And it, it's the central nervous system, uh, we can't replace it yet. It's it's just hard to you can't do it. Do it yeah, uh, there'll be improvements. There'll probably be a long ways off, mm -hmm. but the stem cell research is where it'll be. My my next question is, um, I'm, and my last is there, as you recall, Jack and I both have the cross technology hearing aids, uh, and we've had them for probably three three years now. Um, not that long. Maybe not that long, but any, is there any advancements in hearing aids when you have almost totally deaf in one ear and pretty good hearing in the other? Here, here's, you know, I'm, I i do not sell hearing aids, so. Uh, <laughs> right. But, but here's, here's the thing you got to glasses. Uh, yeah, that's a cranial nerve. The optic nerve is a cranial nerve. But you can take someone who's got nerve change in their or visual changes in, and you can make up for a lot of that with the glasses. With hearing aids, you have, you have an altered ear. So this ear is altered. Mm -hmm. It's got a nerve damage. It's got something going on. And a hearing aid is micro compared to, the, if you go to buy a, a stereo system, you aren't going to buy the smallest speakers you aren't going to want to have miniaturization of your stereos. You want to have a woofer and a subwoofer, and, and you want to be able to sit there and just feel the vibrations of music. Well, you take an altered ear, and a hearing aid takes the sound and alters it. So you alter the sound with the hearing aid, putting it into an altered ear. You've got double alteration. And you hope for the best. And it, it'll usually be better than if you don't have the hearing aid. But we're still, it's, there's still limitations. I would say this, that the hearing aid industry is continuing to improve digital hearing aids, which are not cheap. There's no question about it. I, I bought a car a long time ago for a lot less than a hearing aid. Um, but... Uh, they, they're definitely uh, progressing. Uh, there's no question that it's different now than if just a few years ago. And I'm not a big fan of all in the ear hearing aids. Uh, this idea, oh, I don't want somebody to see me wearing a hearing aid. The kids are running around with earbuds in and wires around and it's telephones on the side of their head. And uh, it, it, this idea that, that, that vanity should play a role, I would want, my attitude is, uh, and the day's gonna come when I need to hear it. I was a percussion major in music school. 
I was on a drum line forever. I've got hearing loss, which it's getting close uh, to where I'm going to need a hearing aid. The, the thing is, is the digital hearing aid, it goes behind the ear and then comes around with an earpiece. You get a much better result with it. It's easily, more easily programmable. And all you got to do, an all in the ear hearing aid, here's what you'll see. People keep pushing them in. Keep pushing. Put your finger in your ear and move your mouth, and your ear canal changes its shape. And when you're talking, if you're talking to John, he's going to, he, your hearing aid would move. And I see the other half of the Hazelton family there. <laughs> uh, also, John. Uh, anyway, uh, the behind the ear hearing aid, when you put the earpiece in, it has a it has a give to it, and all in the ear hearing aid doesn't have any give to it, and and therefore it tends to move very little in and out of the ear canal, and so you get better fidelity. You get a better sound. So I, I always encourage patients when I said, hey, look, you need a hearing aid and go for a behind the ear, otherwise they got BTE, uh, if you want to speak their language, um, a BTE, and, and you get the clear plastic tuber. Now they've got <clears throat> some wires that come, and so that it's actually a, the receiver is in, <clears throat> in the ear. I see a throat diver. And the receiver is in the ear. And I gotta, I gotta get a drink. What anyway? That the fidelity will be infinitely better with the behind the ear, and you can adjust it. And, and in this day and age, the digital hearing aids are more expensive, but they're definitely the way to go. And um, you know, I, I think the days of worrying about vanity. Hopefully, are, are behind us. I mean, all you got to do is that, 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 that with the number of kids that are running around with stuff in their ear, it's just, yeah. I mean, I don't think that, you know, it, I, yeah. I don't think that when I was a kid, there was a pharmacist in my hometown in Wisconsin, great guy, and he had a body hearing aid, and it was a big thing that sat here and it and wires coming up here. And it kind of scared me. I mean, I, I can remember uh, probably eight or nine years old. He had this, and yet a, a body hearing aid, it, it, was, it was what they had. And some hearing, I, I will only say that some hearing is better than no hearing. Um, and your significant other will get very tired of you saying what or huh. And, <laughs> yeah. and, 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 and you know, I, it's just, it, it, I think as, as you and I grow older, you, you want to be with your friends and, and if you can't communicate or they say, well, you don't listen to me, so I won't even call you to go out to dinner or something. I, I think that's sad because then you kind of you, you get isolated and um, yeah. I don't want to be isolated. So, uh, I, but uh, I, I, I hope I don't step on anybody's feet, but an all in the ear hearing aid to me, it's not the way to go. Yeah. Uh, the majority I, of patients are going with RICs or BTEs. Yeah, BTE. BTE. yep. mm -hmm. It just, it, it just, if you're going to go, if you're going to spend money, you might as well get the best for your money. And an all in the ear hearing aid, if that's all you can do, well, okay, but it's not getting the best for your money. Yeah, it's absolutely. definitely not getting the best for you. Yeah. And we have um, a patient in the chat box asked, and we touched a little bit of it because you were talking about tinnitus um, that's, you know, in the brain. But they, what causes <laughs> tinnitus? <laughs> Number one cause of tinnitus is nerve damage. Yeah. Little cells in the, in the ear, in the inner ear called hair cells in the cochlea and and you take mechanical sound that moves sound a sound wave is mechanic moves the eardrum which moves the ear bones creates a, a movement of fluid in the inner ear and that fluid stimulates because of the frequency stimulates certain hair cells and those hair cells send a, a nerve impulse 
to the brain. And then it's interpreted in the hearing area of the brain. When those nerve cells, those hair cells get damaged because of a blast injury, or you can get chemical. I mean, there's certain antibodies, we call them aminoglycosides, uh, genomycin, canamycin, the vancomycin, and these mice, and those are reserved for really bad, life-threatening infections, but they can, they're ototoxic. They can kill your ears. Uh, aspirin in high doses can damage your ears. Uh, but it, it, when those are damaged, then the, the brain has, in essence, an injury, and it sends that message out to you as tinnitus. Uh, and, you know, it, it, there's a certain background tinnitus, just like there's background noise in the environment. There is, if you're trying to go to sleep, and you, you may hear some tinnitus every now and then, I mean, normally it'll, it, it can come and go, and, it, it, but when there's serious nerve damage, well, then you got, when they were developing treatments, when they were doing the, the Panama Canal, they would give people anti-malarial drugs based on quinine. Uh, and, and they didn't know, they'd just give people a dose and you took it till your ears rang. And it, 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 if you did it too long, you got permanent damage from quinine. Uh, that's why there, I've even seen products that quinine water, I'm going, whoa, uh, don't go there. There's a drug that's used for heart situations called quinidine. Um, and if you read the fine print that say, hey, you know, this, because it's, it's quinine based. Um, aspirin, if you take too much aspirin, your ears are gonna ring. And if you do it long enough, not only will you maybe get a hole in your stomach and bleeding, but you're gonna have tinnitus. And once that damage occurs, that's it. Um, so it, it, the most common cause of tinnitus and, and the preferred tinnitus is fine, but the preferred is tinnitus. Uh, once you get that, it's there. It, it, if, you've, if you notice a lot of tinnitus because of fluid in your ear, get rid of the fluid, the tinnitus will go away. If the ear is plugged with wax, uh, get rid of the wax and the tinnitus will, go, will be put back in the corner and you probably won't hear it. But again, uh, wax is kind of another problem. Uh, you know, you can scratch somebody else's back, but you can't necessarily scratch your own. Uh, wax is not the enemy. It's your, think of it as your fingernail. You trim your fingernail, you don't remove your fingernail. Mm -hmm. And Q-tips in ears are a disaster. Um, and, and people, they get, they get off after wax with such a vengeance. And, and I'm telling you, cleaning your own ear usually is fraught with a problem. And I'm kind of, it, because of my orientation as an otolaryngologist, uh, I all too often see where they go to their primary care doctor and the primary care doctor thinks they're doing you a favor, and they the doctor tells his or her assistant, flush their ear. Okay. The doctor doesn't do it. This is the, probably the lowest person on the totem pole would do it. And the next thing I know, I get a call. They've got bleeding from the ear. They didn't get the wax out, and now they're in serious pain. And then you got troubles. Um, and you know, I'm, personally, uh, you got to have the right equipment, and you got to you got to be used to working in an ear, literally all the time. And so, it, I mean, it sounds self-serving, but I think if you got wax, probably you need to see an ear doctor, a real ear doctor. And if and you have to put them under the microscope, put them under the microscope. Uh, but this idea that it's a uh, it's a nothing to it, and over-the-counter wax removal stuff. I never recommend that. Uh, Kleenex on the end of your fingers is just fine. Can't go wrong with that. Q-tips, you'll get some wax out, but the rest gets pushed in, and eventually you've got the ear totally. It's like a muzzle-loading rifle. 
and you just keep tamping it in and then when the hearing is off believe me you're you're miserable yeah you're, you're miserable but wax is not the enemy it's it's but that i i got off the no, question with anything yeah. yeah but uh yeah the tinnitus it, since i had a lot of noise exposure in music school my ears ring constantly but it doesn't really get in my way and it, it, but is it there yeah absolutely and I, I if i went back as a kid because i started competitively performing when i was in fifth grade um I would wear earplugs, mm -hmm. but we didn't wear any earplugs when I was in music school. And I was on a drum line, literally, forever. I played with the Minneapolis Symphony for a year. I, I was head of the drum section of the University of Wisconsin marching band, four years of wonderful experience. But I did, we didn't wear, they all wear earplugs now. We didn't wear any earplugs. It was mm -hmm. stupid, but, <laughs> That's the way but was. nobody was wearing it. Yeah, nobody. Sabine, do you have a question? Yes. Is there any way, Dr. Kirkham, to lessen the tinnitus sounds? Are there any yes. tricks? Yeah, you can, she has devices that are called tinnitus maskers. Okay. And 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 uh, you can they can be incorporated in, in some hearing aids, but tinnitus masking devices, uh, well, it basically, you're trying to fool the ear. I'll, I'll call it that okay. to mask it. Um, I sleep with a sound machine. My wife has, and you know my wife. Uh, my wife has excellent hearing, uh, but at night is when the tinnitus that I have is. It, 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 I can sleep without it, with it or without it, but a, a masking sound which is white noise basically you can get these sound generating things that will make the sound of a surf or wind chimes oh my god it drive me crazy um but just white noise white noise which is white noise is is all different frequencies white light is all different colors white noise is all different frequencies and you you have it at a level of loudness that helps mask cover up uh the tinnitus but um, it's either use masking device when trying to sleep, or you can wear a tinnitus masker, which looks like a hearing aid. Uh, and because it, it can be a real problem. I mean, she, she's got to deal with it. I mean, my, I mean, if I had somebody that was really complaining about, I'm saying, you know, you need to go to total hearing and you know, because there are devices there that can, and, and the key is is tailoring it to the pitch of your tinnitus. If your tinnitus is high pitch, and the masking device is set at low pitch, you're going to you're going to you're still going to hear it. You you want it to be that white noise covers all of those frequencies, but a masking device of that they have, then you you. You smart bomb it at the area where the pitch is, and mm -hmm. uh, that I mean, if you get it at the right frequency. Okay. Any other questions, Stella? I thought I saw you have your hand raised. Um, let's see. Okay. Yep. Yeah, one moment. Let me There's get Kathy. you. Kathy. Kathy Landwehr. I don't hear it. If you'll unmute your microphone there, we'll be able to hear you. Okay. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, can you hear can you hear me? Yes, yes. we can hear you. Oh, okay, good. Um, it's had hearing aids for about three years uh -huh. or so, but I have noticed that when he first got them and he took them off that he could still hear pretty good but it seems like the longer he has them and he, like he'll take them off to go to get a shower or i'll say something to him while he's walking i i can't hear you i just can't hear you so does the even with good hearing aids um can the hearing 
just decrease so that once they're out, he can't hear me as well as he did when he first got them? Yeah, and Kathy, what you're seeing is that neither one of us are getting younger. Right. <laughs> the hearing aid, aid is basically staying the same. Although hearing aids do age. They got a life expectancy of let's just say five years, plus or minus. But uh, Ed is getting older each day as I'm getting older each day. And aging process changes the ear. So basically the hearing aid, I'm, I'm simplifying, the hearing aid stays the same, but the hearing aid keeps changing. So where it was really maybe up here and this would work, now it's down here and it isn't quite the same and you're noticing that. He probably doesn't notice it as much as you will notice it because you may think he's ignoring you, but he's <laughs> probably just not hearing you. I mean, it's just okay. it's just life. But it is that yeah. You know, um, it, we're not we're all getting older, um, it, and uh, it, but you got to keep in mind that hearing aids don't they metal fatigues, and there is metal in a hearing. Aid. It may be tiny, but it's still just like an airplane wing. Airplanes are taken out of commission because. The, the metal fatigues. And when the metal fatigues, this thing runs out of gas. And, and it doesn't work as well as it did in the past. And that's just as simple as it, to break it down. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, Absolutely. Old hearing aids. I, I mean, I have people who say, well, grandma died and, and she's got these 20 year old hearing aids. Can I use them? <laughs> Three, use them. They're not dangerous. But th th that's oh, making an assumption that all hearing aids are the same and all hearing loss are the same. And that the 20 year old hearing aids have an age. They age too, the metal fatigues. But okay. you know, if he doesn't behave, just tell him you're not going to fix him his coffee. That's all. There you go. And we have some venison for you. <laughs> really enjoyed all of this talk. It's really yeah. opened up a lot of good yeah. things. And oh, well, uh, <laughs> you were breaking up. I had to ask her what you said. Uh, okay. You know, I, I, you know how much I love venison. I'm not a hunter, but, uh, uh, you know, where I grew up in, in venison, it's good for you, too. It's healthy for you. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I, I will only tell you, uh, I will be glad to give you a call and we can arrange that. I okay. have um, sounds perfect. All you right. Do. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Talk to you and good to see you. This was oh my good God, years. Tyrone. So Tyrone, hi. Do you have a question? I'm gonna ask you to unmute. You can unmute. I I just wanted to say hi to Dr. Kirkham. It's good to see him and seeing him. Hi Tyrone. How you doing? Absolutely buddy? fabulous vocalist. This guy's got it. He's, wow. he's uh, Marvin Gaye Ian, reincarnated. Uh, <laughs> only because you took care of me for so many years. That's why. So. <laughs> oh, well, that's thank you for coming. Dr. Kirk. Oh, no. Care of you. Yeah, Have you been back to Israel lately? I'm going back in May, matter of fact. And I've been back. Yeah. I went back in October. Yeah. Yeah. So. That was his church. Wow. Good guy. Dynamite talent. Yeah. Awesome. All right. Pat Steven said such an excellent program. Thank you. Yeah, this was good. It was really good. Even the part I caught was really good, Dr. Kirkham. Thank you. Good to see you, Tyrone. Good to see All you right. too. We have a drawing here, and the winner of the drawing is Subi Hazelton. Oh. Yes. <laughs> So call the office and um, I'll give you our number. It's 214-987-4114. It's our Glen Lakes office. And we would love to 